Right, um, this is the topic on addictions, opioid and pain. All I can say about this to first and foremost is this is important. You are going to get this in the exam in some form or another, so um, get a handle on it. And it's important as well to be a good pain specialist and, and um, use safe opioid prescribing uh, procedures. This is the way we're going to discuss this topic. We're going to look at definitions. We're going to look at changes in opioid prescribing, um, the changes that have happened over the last 10 years or so. And we're going to spend a bit of time focusing on that again because that's a classic exam question. It's been asked, it's been asked twice in the Australian exams and it's ripe fodder for, to be repeated. We're going to look at opioid risk stratification, good exam question as well. And we're going to give you the principles of safe opioid prescribing. Right, let's move on to the definitions. Now, tolerance and dependence will be uh, discussed in greater detail in the topic on opioids, but I'm going to give it to you here so it fits in with this discussion. So tolerance, I'm just going to read it through. It's an adaptive state that occurs following exposure to a drug over time, which leads to changes that include a reduction in one or more of the effects of the drug with no change in the disease state. So essentially tolerance is a desensitization process. The body becomes desensitized or physiology becomes desensitized. Now opioid induced hyperalgesia, the definition you could say it's a paradoxical response to opioid agonists that lead to pain via pro nociceptive effects rather than the analgesic effects, rather than the analgesia. An opioid-induced hyperalgesia is a sensitization process, so this, this um, causes sensitization and upregulation. So physical dependence, now, um, it depends on how you, um, sorry, I'm going to, I'm jumping the gun. Physical dependence, again, I'm just going to read it through. It's an, uh, an ad adaption to a drug whereby abrupt discontinuing the drug or reversing the drug or a sudden reduction in the dose of the drug leads to a withdrawal syndrome and this is treated by giving the drug so that's physical dependence right here's what I was jumping the gun to the definition or the difference between addiction and substance dependence now essentially they're both the same thing just divide, de de defined by different organizations and um, you should pick the way you're going to define it. So are you going to use the word addiction or are you going to use the word substance dependence? I use the word substance dependence because it doesn't carry that stigma that addiction does. So whether it's addiction or substance dependence, they've got five C's that are involved. It's a chronic, it's a compulsive um, disorder. There is control or lack thereof that's um, involved. There's craving for a drug and there's continued use. So that's a good way of remembering um, addiction and substance dependence. So addiction, now this is the definition according to the American Academy of Pain Medicine, American Pain Society, and the American Society of Addiction Medicine. It's primary, it's chronic, it's neurobiological, there are genetic, psychosocial, and environmental factors that influence the development of this disease and its manifestations and it's characterized by behaviors that include one or more of the following and those are the C's that we've discussed. So that's addiction from the Americans. Now substance dependence, uh, this is the diagnosis, this is diagnosed according to the DSM-4 which uh, was out in 1994. Interestingly, the DSM-4 or the DSM-5 is almost out and that's going to be out in the next couple of years. So um, this may change. So DSM-4, maladaptive pattern of substance use leading to a clinically significant impairment or distress. And it's manifest by three or more of the following over a 12-month period. And this is, um, these are the seven things that you need to have three or more from. So tolerance, withdrawal, yes. Use of uh, substances in larger amounts over longer periods of time, yes. Uh, persistent desire, yes, so that's the, that's the craving. Uh, time spent in, op in obtaining the drug. Um, it interferes with social, occupational, recreational activities. And that's what most DSM criteria, uh, classification or diagnosis are. There is some kind of interference. And of course there's continued use, as we said, so one of the other C's. 
So pick your term and stick to it and use it and know the difference. Now aberrant behavior, now this is something that took me a while to get my head around um, and I'm hopefully going to give this to you uh, succinctly so you can understand it quickly. Aberrant behavior are, the, are these um, odd behaviors that some patients can display that may lead you to think that um, they're at risk of going on to develop substance abuse or addiction. Now there are four types of aberrant behaviors or there are four worsening types of behavior leading to the fourth one which is problematic opioid use or aberrant behavior. So it starts off with illicit drug use and this is non-physician initiated and maintained. So they get drugs from elsewhere. Uh, then there's prescribed drug use where they get drugs from a physician. Um, so these two, the illicit and prescribed drug use, are, are not constant and not, not ongoing. It's every now and then. Similar to sporadic substance abuse where um, they take it sporadically and they don't really get any withdrawal effects. Now this could lead on to problematic opioid use or true aberrant behavior and this is the one to, to be on the lookout for and this is the one that's displayed by some of our patients. This doesn't happen often. Not all of our patients on opioids are going to be at risk of getting addiction and dependence. I think the, the numbers are fairly low. Nevertheless, some patients are going to be at risk. Some patients are already, um, are already displaying substance dependence and they're coming to you because uh, um, f um, uh, medical grade drugs are far better than um, getting drugs off the street. So watch out. So the predictive um, aberrant behaviors, the more predictive aberrant behaviors are the patients that are using alcohol and drugs. So these are the things you need to ask for in your history. These patients are focused on opioids. They, um, they escalate doses without support from the GPs or pain specialists. They always say they've got a problem with opioid prescribing. They need to get repeat prescriptions. They say their scripts have been lost or stolen. And they even try and forge uh, prescriptions. One of my colleagues, um, I remember them telling me a story about a patient that the, the doc stepped out for a second to get a form. Patient stole the prescription sheet. Um, he caught the patient there and then, but nevertheless, some of the patients are doing this. Patients coming to you and saying they need early refills because they've run out. Patients can steal opioids, patients can sell opioids, and they're very resistant to your changes in the opioids, particularly dose reducting. Um, patients can crush and eject opioids, and we had a patient, we've had a series of patients that crushed and injected slow release oxycodone preparations that developed ischemic limbs, and two of them went on to amputations. So doing things they shouldn't be doing with opioids that are prescribed for them. Then the less predictive aberrant behaviors include uh, aggression, hoarding medications, doctor shopping. Doesn't mean they're at risk, but you might just consider. Now, the treatment of tolerance, and I have discussed this in the topic on opioids, but again, for completeness sake, we'll discuss it here. And it is important, so we'll give, you, give it to you again. Now, who's going to be the tolerant patients? Well... These are the patients on chronic opioids, whether it be for medical reasons, whether it be for pain, whether it be for cancer. These are the patients that come to hospital with an acute injury, or an acute problem, or just an elective surgery that are um, uh, abusing opioids, so the substance abuse patients. And the acute tolerant patients as well. We see this on the intensive care unit. Patients uh, get high doses of morphine for a number of days, and they become acutely tolerant to, to opioids. Once you do a number of simple things that we'll outline now, switch the opioids, change something, um, they can improve significantly. So this is your approach to tolerance. Be aware of it, identify it early. Use a number of treatment principles. Now these are for the substance abuse patients. You may need to notify your state authorities or other hospitals, the ED, GP, so you're all on the same page. And I'd advise you to find out which country it is that you're from what the needs are and what, how about you go about uh, or, or notifying your authorities that a patient may be dependent. These patients um, need to be treated with dignity and respect. You need to be non-judgmental when you communicate with these patients because they get that all the time. Um, 
one of the most important things about these patients is to contain and harm reduce. So, so containment, harm reduction, good terminology to use when dealing with these patients or when talking about these patients to your colleagues. Now, it's important to remind you that the behaviors that they display, they're going to misrepresent their level of pain to use it as substance-seeking behavior. So they may say their pain is um, uh, uh, incredibly high, whereas it may not be, and they're using this to gain opioids. So you need to be aware of this. Pain scores may not be the best tools in assessing these patients, and more objectively, you may want to assess functions. So are the patients going downstairs for a cigarette every now and then? Are the patients showering? Are the patients getting up and about? Are they moving about in their bed? Can you examine them easily? So if they're functioning well, then they're likely not to have high pain scores and intensities. We're going to use non-opioid analgesics, and I would encourage you to use as many uh, as you can and as many combinations as you can, depending on the situation. Always consider local anesthetic techniques for the anesthetists out there. Paracetamol, anti-inflammatories, coxibs, and tramadol, so the simple analgesics can be helpful. We use infusions of ketamine and lignocaine and uh, ketamine can be incredibly helpful in these patients and we've had a couple of patients where we've started them on these infusions and you gradually titrate them up and you get to a point where their pain improves significantly. I also encourage you to use gabapentinoids in this situation as now there is evidence out there for its use in the acute situations. Uh, clonidine can be helpful in some patients, I don't find it particularly useful, nevertheless it is an adjunct that is out there to be used. When you need to use opioids, and you're probably going to need to use opioids, you're going to use boundaries uh, in the prescribing of opioids. You're not going to give patients free reign to have as much uh, PRN breakthrough opioid as necessary. You're going to aim to reduce tolerance and opioid-induced hyperalgesia by considering an opioid rotation, and this is due to the uh, incomplete cost tolerance of opioids. You're going to have a low threshold for using ketamine if you're able to do so. And this is in uh, the acute hospital setting where we use it quite a lot. Ketamine used in the chronic outpatient um, uh, scenario is topical. Uh, some people are doing it. It's not supported by um, high levels of evidence. So ketamine is a gray area, but we certainly use it in the acute hospital setting. You're going to want to monitor your patients and you want to going to, you're going to want to prevent opioid withdrawal by using things like clonidine, ketamine. Now, I also mentioned benzodiazepines for withdrawal um, and prevention of withdrawal. However, benzodiazepines, of course, is in itself an incredibly dangerous drug and um, I don't generally use this in these situations. Nevertheless, if they're withdrawing, benzodiazepines are a treatment for withdrawal. You're going to want to set boundaries on unreasonable demands and expectations from your patients. So you're going to want to be firm and flexible. You're going to want to be the consultant. You're going to want to be the specialist. You're not going to be um, uh, pushed by these patients into doing things you're not comfortable with doing. And of course, when you discharge these patients, you're going to need to make sure that there's a care plan in, in place. Right. Changes in opioid prescribing. Very topical. Uh, as I've mentioned, in, uh, asked in our exams a couple of times now over the last two or three years. I'm going to define, uh, we're just going to talk through four broad headings that we could use or that you could use to talk about why the prescribing of opioids has increased exponentially in the last 10 or 15 years. They're going to be changes in the drug availability, less restrictive regulation, the evidence that is conflicting, and prescriber factors as well. <coughs> so. Changes in drug availability. There are a number of opioids out there that are now available. We've got different opioids, we've got different preparations, so slow release preparations, transdermal preparations, and a whole range of various doses that um, are being pushed to us by pharmaceutical companies. They say opioids are safe, opioids are not safe. Uh, nevertheless, the pharmacy companies have, have got opioids out there and being used for chronic non-malignant pain. Less access to heroin and opioid replacement programs. So at the same time, there's more um, pharmaceutical grade op opioids out there. There's less access to opioid replacement. So methadone programs, buprenorphine programs for our um, drug addicted patients. Moving on to less restrictive legislation, certainly in Australia, um, the legislation has changed and it's 
been made easier for um, physicians to prescribe opioids. Uh, in New South Wales, I don't think you need to um, get an authority to prescribe opioids. Um, it's it's in your reading it's in your reading package. So I don't want to say anything in case I say the wrong thing. Um, drug the Drug and Poison Act also is important, and I advise you to to uh, if you're from the UK or elsewhere, go to your legislation and see what changes are there, or what restrictions are in place with regards to opioid prescribing. The pharmaceutical benefit scheme that subsidizes medications here has now put uh, the use of opioids for non-cancer pain on the subsidy so it's again easier to prescribe it. Patients don't need to pay for it or get subsidized the medication costs. Now the evidence in using opioids for non-malignant pain is not fantastic. Um, looking at your pain summit or the Australian pain summit um, the things that we've got from that are one in five patients have chronic pain. It costs about 34 billion dollars a year 80% of these patients are not getting the appropriate treatment and it's the third most expensive health problem out there. So everyone's having summits as well, good exam questions, so be aware of what your local summit has, um, has said and advised, so that's another bit of reading material for you. Um, we're pointing you to the, to the appropriate summits and reading material on our wiki, so just go and have a look at that and you'll be pointed to the right direction. So looking at the evidence, let's get back to the evidence. <coughs> There's a good article by Jane Ballantyne, and you've got the reference in your reading package. And at best, the evidence of opioids or the efficacy of opioids is small, with about 30% of patients getting mild to moderate pain, uh, sorry, mild to moderate short-term relief of pain compared to, compared to placebo. That's essentially very little, if anything. Um, so efficacy for opioids in chronic non-malignant pain is not there. It might be useful in a small group of patients, I don't know what that group of patients is, um, and most of us don't, and the evidence doesn't point us to that group of patients. It might be we shouldn't be treating pain, but we should be looking at function. So if they're functioning well, then opioids may not be useful. We need to consider the side effects of opioids. And of course, we don't know what dose to give as well. And uh, there is a general consensus out there that when you're getting to doses of more than 100 milligrams of oral morphine equivalent per day, you're probably getting into a high dose range. And of course, now that we've got many people living with cancer and cancer being considered a chronic illness in some situations, some of these patients are going on to display aberrant behavior and problematic opioid use. Prescriber factors, you can't talk about changes in prescription of opioids without talking about prescriber factors. Our prescribers, our primary care physicians, other hospital doctors, have had limited training in the use of opioids. They are, have limited time as well, some of our GPs have minutes to see patients and it's far easier <clears throat> to prescribe them an opioid than go through the whole multidisciplinary education, non-pharmaceutical approach to treating some of these patients. And of course there is also limited consensus out there in how to go about dealing, these pa dealing with these patients. Right, let's move on to opioid risk stratification and I've mentioned it, it's a great exam question. There are a number of uh, interesting reading articles out there. This is one recently from the IASP clinical updates. Um, I'd advise you to have a look at that. This talk or this part on opioid risk stratification is based on that um, IASP update, so you'll get most of the information in your reading package anyway. So when you're stratifying on opioids, you're going to have pre-opioid screening and then you're going to have ongoing screening. So before you start opioids, you're going to have to screen them or you should screen them. And then as you're ongoing the treatments, you're going to want to keep in touch with them and screen them along. So those are the things that we can use. Now I'm just going to talk about uh, two of the pre-opioid screeners that I find quite useful, as well as the ongoing screening. So the pre-opioid screeners are the screener and opioid assessment for patients in pain, so so-called SOAP and the opioid risk tool, um, the ORT. So the screener and opioid assessment for patients with pain. There are long forms, I think there were 24, worked its way down to 14 questions, and now we've got a short form which has got five questions. Each question can be answered from zero to four, zero being never and four being very often. So the first question, do, how often do you have mood swings? Zero, nothing or never, four very often. How often do you smoke a cigarette within an hour after you wake up? <coughs> Excuse me. 
How often have you taken medication other than the way it was prescribed? And these are the things now that we need to find out from our patients. How often have you used illegal drugs in the past five years? How often in your lifetime have you had legal problems or been arrested? Now we see patients a lot that have had um, that have had opioid problems, and they they are definitely associated with those that have been in, been in jail or had legal problems. So if somebody scores more than four, greater than or equal to four um, points from all those five questions, you could consider them a positive uh, screen for opioid risk. The opioid risk tool is another one that's been out there and seems to be validated to a point. It's a, a, um, a five-point um, yes-no tool. It's divided into males and females, and you score differently depending on what, whether you're a male or a female. And I've got it up there for you to have a look at, and we'll briefly work our way through it. If you've got a family history of substance abuse, um, you score a number of points depending on whether it's alcohol, illegal drugs, or prescription drugs. Obviously, you're scoring higher if you're having prescription drugs that you're abusing. Personal history of substance abuse, same thing. You need to be between 16 and 45, and that scores you a point. Now, this is the tricky one. Um, you get three points for females with a history of pre-adolescent sexual abuse. Now, this is something you're not going to come out and ask most most um, females before you restratify them or before you prescribe opioids. This is not something you're not going to do on first on a first visit. So, this is one of the disadvantages of the ORT is that. I'm not sure whereabouts you're going to get this information from. You're clearly going to have to have a rapport with your patient before you do this. But it's these patients that you've got a rapport with that you're going to go on to prescribe opioids with anyway. So it may be okay in, in, um, on the whole. And then those with psychological diseases are going to get, get points as well. Now if you score between 0 and 3, you're considered a low risk. If you score between 4 and 7, you're considered a moderate risk. And of course, greater than greater than and equal to eight, a high risk. So that's the pre-opioid screening. Now let's go on to ongoing screening. So as that means if your patients are on opioids already, um, how are you going to monitor their their response to the opioids and if they're getting into any danger? And most of my patients, I haven't prescribed opioids for a long time. Most of my patients come to me already on opioids. So I don't need to do any risk stratification. I can pick up those that shouldn't be on opioids, but getting them off opioids is quite a challenge. So these are the things you need to look at for the patients on opioids. The four A's as defined by PASIC, and you've got the, uh, you've got the reference in your package. I've extended it to six A's, and the four A's are going to be analgesia, so what's it like? What are the activities of daily living? So what's their function like? What are the adverse events? So are they having any side effects from the medication? Are they displaying any aberrant behaviors? And we've discussed that previously. And then the additional two A's, what is their affect? So what's their mood like? And you're going to want to accurately document um, your meeting with them. Right, let's move on to the principles of safe opioid prescribing. Now I've given you three or four references, one from um, a bulletin for GPs, one from the pain faculty, uh, recently published recommendation for safe opioid prescribing, and a couple of interesting articles as well on safe opioid prescribing. One of them calls it universal precautions in opioid prescribing, and I've, I've put them all together and presented them to you in this format. So this is what you're going to do, safe opioid prescribing, fantastic exam question, and important of course as well. So comprehensive assessment, you're going to want to consider an MDT assessment, you're going to want to assess function in your patients, you're going to want to assess whether there's neuropathic pain, and if you find a cause, you're going to treat the cause. So do a proper assessment before you jump in. You're going to want to do a physical examination, musculoskeletal examination, neurological examination, depending on the patient and depending on the complaint. You're going to look for in that examination any features of neuropathic pain that you may focus on, you're going to look for any features of chronic pain. So are they, uh, do they have any uh, deconditioning? Do they uh, uh, not move well? Is there any disuse atrophy of muscles? And you're going to want to look for evidence of substance abuse. So are there any track marks? Are they malnourished? Psychological screening just must be done. Opioid risk stratification we've discussed. You're going to have to have a working differential diagnosis that you may need to work through before you consider them going on to opioids. 
do the non-pharmacological therapy, so do the physiotherapy, do the OT, consider them for um, pain programs and CBT, consider some pain interventions and anesthetic blocks. Use rational pharmacotherapy. So in other words, before you chuck in opioids into the mix, get them off their sedatives. Treat the sleep with tricyclics and gabapentinoids. Get the uh, simple analgesics on board, so give them the anti-inflammatories if appropriate. Paracetamol can be helpful. If they have depression, treat the depression with an SNRI. Use adjuncts, as I've just mentioned, so use the anti-neuropathic agents if necessary. And it might be worth a trial of anti-neuropathic agents before you move on to opioids. You're going to want informed consent and written, and you may even choose to do written contracts with some of the, some of the high-risk patients you're going to need to educate them on the side effects. They need to know that you're not just treating their pain, but you're treating their function as well. You're going to discuss the trial of opioids. So you're not going to just start them on it and not have, a, not have an opt-out or get-out-of-jail uh, plan. One prescriber, one, one dispenser. Slow-release preparations are what need to be used. And you're going to have triggers in place when to stop the medication. So if they're escalating the doses, if they're displaying aberrant behaviors, if they're not doing what they need to do, these are triggers to stop the medication. A trial of opioids. You'll be amazed at how many um, of my colleagues are still using immediate release preparations, how many of them. Um, I've got three or four patients out there that are still getting IM pethidine injections um, that we're gradually getting them off. Um, it's going to be slow titration. You're going to use slow release preparations, and you're going to have a sealing dose. So. 100 milligrams is probably a good sealing dose to just to start with. No pethidine, no injectables, no immediate release preparations, and no other sedatives. This is consensus from our faculties. You're going to want to assess their pain and function before and during treatment, we've mentioned. Treat and prevent side effects as well. Um, tell them that they shouldn't be operating any heavy machinery, tell them that they shouldn't be driving during dose uh, titrations, treat the constipation and treat the nausea as well. Regularly assess the six A's which we've discussed and reduce the risk of diversion so use proper prescription pads. Um, draw, your, draw a line through the empty space in your scripts. Don't allow them to add in anything to your scripts. Prescribe small amounts um, use numbers, use words. These are all simple things, but nevertheless, they need to be considered for all patients. Don't prescribe over the phone. And you may choose to do random medication counts and even random um, urine drug testing in some patients. So we're almost at the end. And I'm going to now just talk you through uh, an example of how you, how you would choose to manage a high-risk patient. So according to the ORT, <coughs> If a patient is scoring a uh, low risk, so score less than three, they're going to be managed by their primary care doctor alone. You could have a verbal agreement in place only. You might do a urine drug screen once or twice a year. You could follow them up every three months. And you could dispense safely for about four weeks at a time. This is not what you should be doing. This is just an example of how you may choose to do it. Immediate risk, four to seven. You're going to want to use uh, the primary care doctor is going to want to have be supported by specialists if necessary, so pain and addiction specialists. You may have a written agreement. You may urine drug test them three or four times a year. You're going to dispense for two weeks at a time. Whereas those now scoring at high risk, so greater than eight, if you must use it, that's the first thing I would say, do I really need to use opioids? You're going to have a pain specialist and an addiction specialist looking after these patients, not a GP. There's going to be a written agreement in place. You're going to do random drug testing. You're going to do random pill counts. You're going to only use opioids as a last resort, and that, that would be the first thing that comes to my mind. Do I really need to use opioids in these patients? And you may even choose to dispense daily. So that's an approach to principles of safe opioid prescribing. And that concludes this lecture.